Good morning, 671st. Uh, this is First Lieutenant Jose Aguilar. I'll be giving you a Ukraine situation brief. Um, the, the main rationale for this is I know a lot of people have families, uh, friends, and just general people who ask them a lot of questions about what's going on in Ukraine, uh, what's the Army's role in Ukraine, and the purpose of this brief will to give us the historical background uh, to be able to tell us how we got to this situation that we're having currently in the Ukraine. Uh, there'll be a little bit of history, uh, there'll be a little bit of current events, uh, but that's the overall overview of what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, so first up, here's our agenda. We're just gonna look at the physical and political geography of Eastern Europe, moving on to the history of the Ukraine, uh, as well as some recent events, some of the main uh, geopolitical powers and players uh, who have interest in the region and why. Uh, and then we'll go over the updates in a separate video. I'm just going to be using this one as the base video of the kind of how did we get to what's happening in Ukraine. And then please feel free to ask questions or comments uh, in the Google Classroom, and I'll be trying to get back to you as quickly as possible. I know a lot of you have valuable insight. A lot of us are keeping up to date, which I really appreciate on the events happening over in Eastern Europe and the Ukraine. Uh, so I'd love if you don't just post questions, but also comments and updates to what you've been seeing as well. So first up, uh, pretty simple, where is Ukraine? I know this might seem like a pretty um, basic, pretty simple question, but it is important to know just on a political map, where is the Ukraine? It's just in Eastern Europe. I will talk a little bit more about the geography uh, in the next slide. But the basic takeaway is, again, Eastern Europe bordering the Russian Federation to the East Belarus to the north, which is an ally of Russia, Poland to the west, a key strong ally of the U.S. and NATO, and Romania as well as Moldova to the south. Uh, so kind of, as we can see, surrounded on its west and south by more friendly powers towards Ukraine's sovereignty, and then a little bit less friendly powers of Belarus and Russia um, to the north and east. So the physical geography of Ukraine, which will come up quite a bit, in the history, or history of Ukraine, uh, we can see basically three main features I'd like to point out to you. First is the location of um, the higher elevation that is mostly in the western region uh, with Romanian, uh, or I guess the Transylvanian mountain range in the west, uh, higher elevation, whereas there's much lower elevation as there's a lot of river valleys in the east and on the border of Russia. Um, that could potentially be a good striking uh, route for the Russians, un unfortunately. Um, so the, the change in elevation is the first takeaway when looking at the physical geography. However, secondly, you have the Dnipur River. Apologies for my pronunciation, uh, but the Dnipur River is the central river that basically cuts the country into half. Uh, you'll see that the capital of Kiev um, is... Uh, along that major waterway, a very important waterway, as we'll see with the history. And then finally, to the south, the bordering of the Black Sea, which is a uh, major sea uh, that's very important um, for shipping, as it does have access to the Mediterranean and therefore um, the oceans of the world through the uh, Bosphorus Strait. Okay. Moving on to the political geography of Europe. Main takeaway from here is know what NATO is. If people ask you what NATO is, it's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It was originally created to deter the Soviet Union from influencing Europe or further influencing Europe at that time. Uh, and the main takeaway you'll notice is that NATO has been expanding eastwards over the years, incorporating new members. However, Ukraine has not been incorporated. Uh, and again, uh, you'll see that various countries have been trying to join NATO and the NATO basic synopsis is an attack on a NATO country is an attack on all NATO countries. Therefore, uh, by Russia attacking Ukraine, uh, no one had any political obligations um, via NATO or any defense alliance or treaty to come to the Ukraine's aid. Um, so if we're kind of confused as to why the response hasn't been greater from the Western world, uh, that's probably why, or at least a contributing factor. Okay, uh, so here we got the history of the Ukraine. I tried to divide it, make it pretty simple. Uh, a lot of people say, are Russians and Ukrainians the same people? Do they come from the same people? Um, no, 
Not really. Obviously, over the years, we're all kind of mutts to a certain extent. We have intermixed with a lot of different peoples. However, uh, the Ukrainians are originally populated or the, the area of modern day Ukraine was originally populated by Eurasian steppe peoples. These are the people kind of if you can see my mouse, I don't know if the screen recorder records it, but there's been a lot of migration from the Eurasian steppes. That's like the Turkish people, uh, the Huns, the, the Hunnic people, the Mongols, all kind of from the Eurasian steppe, kind of Central Asia, roughly the flat areas of Central Asia. Um, speaking of the Dnieper River, as we did previously, you'll see that it plays an important role in the history of Ukraine. As Vikings and Slavs created a trading empire using the Dnieper River, so we can even see historically, this is a value, valuable asset to the people of the region who would like to use the river for trade and transportation, as we still see today. Uh, the Kievan Rus, which was a bit of a precursor um, to modern day um, Ukraine and modern day Russia, that's where you can start to see the ties together. Uh, but anyways, this conglomeration of princely states, so it's princes working together, um, kind of like a confederation, I would say, uh, a, a very loose confederation, bring parts of the Ukraine, the Kievan Rus, bring parts of the Ukraine into their empire, but they are severely weakened by other steppe invaders, uh, such as the Mongols, but also including other groups, which leads to the collapse of the Kievan Rus. Um, after that, um, the Mongol Empire is driven out by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in Eastern Europe. Um, and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, as we can see on this map down low here, does incorporate many parts of modern Ukraine into their territory. Um, however, some parts of Ukraine is still under uh, Mongol control as the Mongols weren't driven completely out. Um, You'll see Russia is on the other side of this former superpower, or I guess just great power, in Eastern Europe, that being the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, now divides Russia from the rest of Europe. That kind of starts Russia's isolation from the Western world, with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth acting as the buffer zone in between those two territories. Uh, but even at this point, you can see some um, kind of a desire for greater autonomy and potentially even sovereignty from the Ukrainian uh, peoples or descendants um, or ancestors of the Ukrainian people, specifically the Cossacks, who were the steppe people in modern Ukraine. Uh, they were great fighters and they demanded and even gained certain levels of autonomy or freedom from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. However, over time, you see the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth slowly start to become a little bit more autocratic and Ukraine wanting that sovereignty um, that they've been desiring for quite some time. Uh, and they actually decide to ally with Russia um, in they basically to overthrow the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and win uh, greater freedom. Um, so they do this. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth is famously defeated uh, in, a, in the wars of the partition, uh, where the country basically stops existing. Uh, but the Ukraine does enjoy some time under the Russian Empire with limited autonomy or freedom. Um, however, they still wanted more independence. And you could see this as they tried to free themselves from Russia by, again, allying with another power who is fighting their imperial overlord, uh, Sweden in the Great Northern War of 1709. However, uh, Sweden and Ukraine are unsuccessful in this war, and the Ukraine is basically harshly subjugated as a response by the Russian people. Um, they seek greater control, Russia seeks greater control over the Ukraine because of the importance of the Black Sea, as we previously stated. You can see the Bosphorus Strait has access to the different oceans of the world. And this will be Russia's only significant warm water port. Yes, Russia had St. Petersburg, or still has St. Petersburg. Uh, however, they're not able to use that important port for trade and transportation during the colder months of the year, as it's basically frozen solid. So this is their only, the Black Sea is Russia's only uh, full-time access to trade via the oceans um, full-time year-round. Um, so that was kind of the, I guess, geopolitical reason why Russia decided to strongly subjugate the Ukrainian people. And this also began a period of Russification of the Ukrainians. 
Uh, the way I describe this to some people is uh, basically what the Americans did to the Native Americans, you know, the whole um, change your name, you're not allowed to speak your native tongue, you're not allowed to have your uh, native name, uh, you have to change your beauty and cultural standards, um, try to behave like a like an American. That's basically the, what the Russians did to the Ukrainians um, during this period of Russification. Uh, and Ukraine severely or very badly wanted to break away from the Russians as they were experiencing very harsh rule under the Russian Empire. And Russia eventually did so some weakness in some uh, 19th and 20th century wars, such as the Crimean War, but then more importantly, World War I, which led to another bid uh, by Ukraine for independence uh, at the end of World War I. Uh, so you see that Ukraine tries to break free from Russian control during the Russian Civil War. Now, the Russian Civil War is a pretty complicated topic in its own right. Uh, but basically, um, there are different political factions vying for the future of Russia, trying to figure out what the future of Ru Russia is going to be. You have the monarchists, you have the communists. Um, and basically, Ukraine uh, sided with not the communists. Uh, so they ended up being on the losing side of the war. And the Soviets also greatly exploit uh, the Ukrainian people, uh, such as the famous Holodomor. Again, apologies for my pronunciation. But it's, again, that failed land reform that's all too common with uh, communist regimes. However, it's very severe land reform as it killed 3 to 12 million Ukrainians as grain production, or not production, grain usage was uh, prioritized for the, for the Soviet people as opposed to the Ukrainian people. Uh, we also talked about the rich river regions in the Ukraine. Uh, it's very fertile grounds, and this is kind of the breadbasket of Eastern Europe historically and even today. So if you see those bread prices rising, that's kind of why, of course. Um, but also, um, this is where the main bread production happened in the past, and that's why um, it was harsh exploitation because the Ukrainians were producing the grain However, they were being exported to Russia uh, forcefully. Um, this rule by the Soviets was so harsh that when the Germans during World War II came in, the Ukrainians were actually very happy. They thought they were being liberated. Um, you saw them even helping out the Germans initially um, because they were just so happy to be free from Soviet rule. That's just how harsh this rule was. Uh, however, um, basically, however, uh, once they kind of realized what the Germans' real intentions were in the Ukraine, they did eventually switch back to the Soviet side, uh, and they were forced to live under Soviet rule until 1991. Uh, this is when the Soviet Union finally fell. Uh, I guess there, you could say 89, 91. It's kind of like, it depends, but the Soviet Union officially dissolved. The Russian Federation was formed. Um, however, Ukraine still maintained many uh, Russian-inspired institutions and problems such as corruption, um, some economic stagnation as a result of some communist policies still remaining, communist leaders basically just changing their titles to be in control of the same industries that they were in control of previously in a supposedly more capitalist economy. Um, and you see this with presidents uh, of Ukraine since 1991, uh, played with the idea of aligning with more with the West, potentially even joining NATO. Uh, presidents over their history uh, since 91 have debated and considered that option, or just the policy of non-alignment, trying to withdraw from the world and not really choose a side. Uh, I will actually bring us to this one in the next video. I took 14 minutes. We'll just call that one the history of the Ukraine up to modern day. And then we'll go over recent events and then the current players. Uh, so I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Uh, and yeah, see you in the next video.